So, um, uh, thanks everybody. So, this is my last talk this year at BoostCon. <laughs> so, uh, we wanted to present you some upcoming works about one of our uh, efforts in bringing parallel programming stuff into uh, Boost and C++ in general. And if you were there last year, uh, we presented NT2, which is one of our main uh, Boost-based tool for parallel programming, which is a matter like proto-based uh, EDSL for HPC. And inside NT2, in fact, lies the component which were um, in charge of dealing with all the uh, internal uh, SIMD instruction set of different architectures. And as NT2 evolved and our work on this part uh, keep going on, at some point it became clear that it could be completely extracted from NT2 and built as a standalone library component. And uh, our reflex was say, okay, let's bring that into a form that could be submitted to Boost. Okay, in the very original name of Boost SIMD. Okay, and meanwhile we had um, a Google Summer of Code uh, student that were accepted on the proposal for working on this uh, boostification of our code base. And uh, in this talk, what we want to show is uh, what's coming in, uh, this upcoming library. Uh, why do we need some kind of um, abstraction level over SIMD instruction sets? Why such kind of architectures uh, technology is still relevant right now? Uh, in the world of many, many cores and GPU and stuff. And to look like how we can actually have this kind of high level interface over this kind of very low level details that can play nice with the traditional component of C++. So basically, what's SIMD? So, SIMD stands for Single Instruction multi -da Multiple Data. It's basically a subset of uh, um, internal process of technology that allows us to process data in a way that instead of having a stream of data composed of one data after the, each other coming in into some kind of instruction uh, processing unit, we have special registers that basically store multiple of same values there that come into a single flow on which we apply the same operation for each element in this um, SIMD vectors or registers. And so basically the logical steps would be, okay, if each cycle I hit up 4, 6, 12, 100 elements per registers, I should have been able to get that much output there, each cycle. And compared to the classical one value per register uh, systems, we should get a speed up of around uh, the width of this vector. Uh, this has been around for a long time. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the first SIMD uh, processing unit into processors came back to uh, HP or something like this, and even Sun. But I think the most known uh, SIMD instruction sets uh, lie there. Basically, they can be split into a uh, tree family. The x86 family, which starts with MMX in 1994 or 5, something like this which then spawned all the SSE, SSE 2, 3, 3 again, 4, 4, 1, 4, 2, and ended up recently with AVX. That stuff are basically available in all your x86 processes and just stay there. There is a lot of differences between all these kind of extensions, either on the size of the vector you can manipulate, okay, 64 bits for MMX, 128 for all the SSE families, 256 for the newest IBX. And next to this, let's say, mainstream uh, SSE uh, stuff, there were some other uh, spin-offs providing other vectorized operations that goes with or next to uh, this kind of extensions. And on the other side of the fence, in the PowerPC family, well, there is basically a bit less. Everything is told, uh, everything is stored in Altivec, uh, which was first released in the uh, PowerPC G4, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, which basically uh, 
is a f well, it's basically equivalent in terms of size to SEC, but has a different approach to how the instruction set was defined. Basically, all the X x86 SIMD instruction set were built with uh, one goal in mind, which was at the time accelerating multimedia applications. So next to traditional operation um, provided by this uh, family of operations, there were a lot of strange um, operations that doesn't make any sense when you look at them like this. But combined, they are the core uh, elements of a lot of multimedia applications. And on the contrary, Altivec was built as a generic um, SIMD extensions with a lot of, with a lot of, with a lot more of traditional operators operating on a larger subset of types. And to do so, or and for other reasons, the main difference between Altivec and the SEC family is a lack of support for double precision float. Uh, Altivec gets uh, gets some. Um, lift up somehow uh, or were adapted into the cell architectures where uh, a traditional Altivec uh, uh, instruction set is available on the PPU and uh, a special one is available on the SPU. And then there is all the ARM uh, processor family which has their own very specific family of vector instructions. So all of this actually lives together right now uh, on different kinds of platforms. Uh, depending on the model of your processor, you may or may not have everything up to there, or missing some if you are on an AMD processor or not. And uh, if you actually want to write a code that say, OK, here is my application, and it's clearly accelerable by this kind of instruction set, and I want it to be portable, it will be a mess. And um, well. And, sh and saying a mess is an understatement. If you want to actually target everything like this in a single way, uh, without any infrastructures, it would be a mess. And so, well, oh, true, it doesn't work. Some people say, yeah, but why not let the compiler do it? Because it's a compiler job to uh, select which kind of ESA I should output when I compile some kind of code. Well, somehow it works get some pretty good uh, automatic vectorization code uh, in some cases. But the problem is some cases. As long as you, as soon as you uh, drift from what the auto vectorization uh, awaits from your code to look like or to handle, you fail and no vectorization is done at all. It has to deal with the way the memory can be uh, adjusted or allocated. Does your code actually make sense for the compiler to be recognized as a vectorizable code segment? There is another problem, which is stuff like compiled uh, function can be revectorized like this. I mean, they sit in their binary files and they just stay there. So, and the most uh, actually uh, striking example of this is the good old libem. There's no way you can get an auto vectorized cosinus or square root out of that. You have to resort to additional uh, library or systems. And well, sometimes your code looks vectorizable, the memory is okay, but there is something the compiler doesn't get right. And to be conservative with the code it generates, say, okay, I won't vectorize. And a classical example, uh, which is not true anymore, but for a long time, GCC was enabled to vectorize some complex structures uh, of loop nests that were handling with raw pointers instead of static arrays. And the same code, just by changing the way you were allocating the memory, was vectorized or not. So, even now, if you really want to get through all these problems and get the most out of your machines, at some point, you will have to deal with writing vector code by hand. And what we wanted to do in this is say, OK, in the same way that, let's say, we have something like boot threads, which is an, an explicit way to uh, specify that we want threading, or we have boost atomic or other such libraries that deals with giving a, a nice abstraction on these low level details. What about having a library which explicitly states that, OK, now I am going to doing some vectorization stuff. And to be actually useful, uh, the way we have to specify that we want to start vectorizing something should actually try to play nice with the rest of the languages. So basically, <coughs> okay, well, uh, we had a lot of ways to actually make this uh, talk. Uh, 
We could have had a large part uh, dealing with all awesome protocols to let us do what we want to do, but we found out that it was not the interesting part uh, to display right now. So the talk is basically built to show you what kind of interface you can get from uh, the library we propose and how it interacts with classical um, STL and uh, Boost components and show how some very classical specific SIMD items can be captured in our library. So, what should we have as an interface if we want to abstract um, competition done with SIMD mode? So, here is a sample of N made uh, C based. Um, SCC code there and Ativec code there, which happens to do A times B plus C for both. And as you see, there is a multiple points where there is div uh, divergence. First, the type which represents the SIMD vectors is completely not the same, okay? And the way the data, the functions are actually uh, called is also different. And there, we can see that in SEC we can basically say, okay, I have vectors of integers, and I will just add two of them there and multiply by the third one. Okay. And it happens that additions and multiplication are um, readily available for this um, type there, which is not the case in the other case, where we have to go through some more hoops to get back from uh, the data we have back to floating point, get some multiplication addition going on, and commenting back to uh, integer. Oh. And this is basically stuff we have to get right uh, every time you have to think about a cross uh, instruction set SIMD code. So what we wanted to try to do is basically Yes. The multiplication function is only available in SSC4, so if you write SSC2. Oh yeah, and that's even worse because this stuff is only available on ACC4. So if you are not ACC4 because your processor is a bit old, well, you have to do this by hand yourselves. And uh, I let you imagine how funky is it to write a multiplication algorithm for integers that actually works without any errors when we were never wrote one. So, all these difference, even in the same uh, family of uh, SAMD functions. So, well, what we wanted at first is completely uh, and trivially um, map um, the way the vector types are actually uh, abstracted away and provide whatever normal operation you want on these kind of types. So we basically have this first abstraction which is called PAC, uh, which is a class that took, takes two parameters. Uh, the first is the type of the element you want to store in your, rec in your SIMD register. And the second one is how many you want in your register. And by default, if you, don't if you don't specify anything, well, we will try to find the best n available for your type t on the current architectures. And what do we call the best n? The best n is the one that actually corresponds to a SAMD register type. So basically, on x86 machine with SEC2 extension, pack float is basically equivalent of pack float 4 because the floating point SIMD register on SEC contains four floor, four float, sorry. And if you pass something there which is not corresponding to a native SIMD register types, well, we will try to emulate something that, so your code still works. I have a question. Yeah? Uh, how do you know? So, uh, do you find out that compile time was the best? Uh, yes, it's all done at compile time. Is it through specialization or through? Yeah. <laughs> we have a small meta function that takes a T and N and try to find the best stuff. Did you and specify which processor are you targeting? As Sorry? You specify the processor target with the macro or something? No, well, the macro say, okay, uh, do I have, uh, well, which kind of architectures I am on? Is it Intel or PC first? Okay, and if I am on um, Intel, uh, what does the compiler say to me about what kind of SIMD extension is set? Okay, and basically when you say GCC something minus a dash M SCC4, there is some macros that get triggered and we catch this. We can discuss afterward, if you want, what this implies in some uh, use cases where you may want to compile stuff so it finds out at runtime what's going on because you want to deploy one executable and not for the people to recompile, which is another valid use case. But for performance purpose, PAC is all driven by compile time uh, directives. So what can 
we put into a T, well, whatever uh, arith uh, fundamental arithmetic types, sharp, short, in, senior or not, float or double, depending on the um, extension, and the only guy that is not a low way to play with us is bull, for reason we will see a bit later. And n must be a power of 2. And so basically we can build uh, instance of these types and, well, it will basically behave like a normal uh, types with all every possible overloaded operators overloaded to uh, generate SIMD code. We transparently uh, handle operation between pack and between pack and scholars, but we work within the SIMD constraints, which means that if you have two packs of char and you had, you had them, what you had back is a pack of char and not a pack of int. Every operation in SIMD basically conserves the types at all because in one register you have that much element going on, you will add them with that much element of the same types and what you want as an output is again that much element of the same type. So the result of pack of unsigned car with 255 plus an unsigned car of 1 will give you a pack of unsigned car of 0. Okay, and every promotion and coercion we will see a bit later has to be explicit. The other difference is the way comparison actually works. All comparison operators behave like we want them to behave in standard algorithm and generic code. They return us a boolean by performing lexicographical comparisons. That means that this returns true if all the elements of both pack are equal. This we do some sorting to say are they lexicographical um, uh, sorted or not. And if you want to get a pack of, let's say, boolean, you want to compare pack A and pack B, and you want to retrieve a pack that say, okay, in this part of the pack, the comparison is true, and in this pack, is false. For this, you have to use the, the three functions that basically maps to each of them, but this time, at a vector level. Well, it returns a pack at the same time. Yeah. That's why I, I put boolean and not bool. You need to repeat comments from the audience for the camera. Okay, sorry. Uh, so, uh, we say, yeah, I say there is no pack of bool, and I write boolean there. When I write boolean there, I really mean something that behaves like a bool, but which is not of type bool. And basically, it returns the same type as the type you put inside, with a value that maps to true or false. And we'll get a bit later on that, because true and false in SIMD code is a bit different than what we have uh, the habit of. And next to that, a pack is a, nicely, uh, is a nice beast because it also models a random access fusion sequence concept, so you can apply whatever fusion algorithm on it. And it's also a random access range. It has a begin and a hand that will iterate over the element of the vector, except that for performance reason and portability, both sequence and range are read only. You can't use at or operator brackets to modify one scalar element inside the vector. Every time you manipulate a vector, it has to be manipulated as a whole. Okay? But if you want to read through each values in the pack, no problem, you can. Which means that, well, you can take a begin in the hand, we will see an example later, of a pack, and pass it to STD accumulate, and you get the sum of the elements in the pack. Stuff like that. Now the other problem is how to get data from somewhere in memory into these SIMD registers. Dealing with memory in SIMD mode is a bit, a bit tricky because it requires all your memory to be aligned on size equivalent to the size of the vector, which means you can't just come out and load whatever addresses you want. Well, in fact you can. And Two stuff can happen. Either you try to do it like this, and it will fail because the internals of the system will either set forth or return crap. Or, on some compilers, it will replace a load function with an unaligned load function, which is between two and five times slower. So, our choices in pack was to force every load and store to be aligned, 
first, and to provide a way to actually emulate a nonlinear load, but in a faster way. So how does it work? So let's say we have a segment of memory there, okay, where the value there is the addresses in hexadecimals of the uh, memory cells. And you say, yeah, I want to load a pack from address OX10, okay, with an offset of zero pack. Well, you will get a pack that contains a value from there. Okay. If you have, if you have called load pack float of OX101, you will have loads of next pack of four over there. Okay. And for load to succeed, P plus I times N should be aligned. So this is a free function work um, function that actually do this, and pack provides a constructor that takes an addresses and an, and an offset to basically perform the load at construction time. Now, how do I? W what if I wanted to load value from one two one three one four and one five into a pack? Well, I can rely on the unaligned load and suffer performance decrease um, it, or well, there is a way in all these various uh, SIMD extensions family to do this in a better uh, and faster way. So basically we have another function which is an overload for load that takes a compile time offset. And basically what we do is we act as if we were loading from p plus i times n plus offset where p plus i times n is still aligned. And basically this call resolves to well different calls depending on the uh, extension that will perform a fast and linear load or, um, uh, operations. And basically, if I do this, I try to load the pack shifted by two from this address. It's basically, yeah, I will try to load from there, but I will jump over two scalar value and start loading from there. And I will load a full pack and get this into the pack. And this is actually one of the most important features uh, we want to have when we're dealing with SIMD is being able to uh, load from random, uh, random addresses like this in a fast way. And the only way to do this is to actually know at compile time what the misalignment value is. And now we have some value from memory down into an SIMD register. We can apply whatever we want on it. And at some point, which is cool, is backing, basically gets that back into memory. And this is done with a store um, function that basically take uh, an address or an iterator, in fact, yeah, an iterator, some offsets, and the pack to store. And so basically, most of the operation we want to run will be some kind of, okay, for all these elements in my memory, I will load them in some way, do a pack of operations on them, and store them again. Which is basically some kind of streaming operation. Well, now, there is a lot of stuff going on in these extensions, uh, which is uh, particularly worthy to catch. One of them is that most of these extensions has a set of fused operations, like um, ACTIVEC has one cycle uh, multiply had um, intrinsic, uh, SEC has some intrinsic for uh, is not less or equal, and, s and stuff like that. So there is arbitrary patterns of computation we want to replace by the actual core to the optimized intrinsic. I want to write pack A, B, C, A equal B times C plus A, but what I want to generate is really VECMAD of A, B, C, because I know that this is faster. And we don't want the user to have to remember to use Mac Whenever you want to make a Mac, we want it to write A plus B times C. So basically what we need is some kind of way to get a lazy evaluation of our expression with PAC. So I guess you see where I want to go. So basically PAC is a proto-entity and every expression you build with PAC is basically an expression template that get optimized before being evaluated. So we basically map all this classical stuff depending on the um, extensions. There is other stuff that can be mapped um, in non-trivial ways. Uh, and well, what we did is basically the way we can extend the library, um, we'll speak a bit more later, 
you can extend it either with providing support for different architectures or different operations, but the optimization systems that say, okay, you give me this, I want to do that, is also open for customization depending on your needs and the needs of the architectures. So basically you don't have to care about, oh yeah, I am on this kind of SIMD system, so I have to write all this kind of code this way. Write it naturally and let the uh, library figure out what you need to do. And of course, all this kind of optimization are recursively done. So if you have something like a polynom uh, evaluation written using an order formula, which is A plus B times C plus D times something else, something else, something else. It will basically degrade into the correct chain of FMA all by itself. So don't overthink, just write your code and let the library uh, generate the correct code. And next to that we have a few uh, additional functions. Uh, we have support for saturated arithmetics, uh, floating point to integer conversions, some classical Lieben functions, mean, max, uh, some bitwise operation, which is uh, rather uh, important in SIMD2 because uh, you can actually write very nice code using this. Uh, some E3I, um, I3E, sorry, operation to extract information about floating point operations. A whole set of predicates that go further than just smaller and or greater. Uh, negation of comparison, comparison with zero, which is uh, optimizable on a lot of instruction set. Some predicates over floating points. Yes? You, there is the extra, the intra are not also, of course, and an or. Yeah, 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 well, of course, that's a non trivial one. We will, of course, have n, or, and stuff like this. Okay, that's so just the extra stuff. And we also have some other stuff which is actually rather nice to have when dealing with SIMD. It's what we call the reduction function that takes a pack and returns you a color. Basically, stuff like any and whole that can take a pack that contains values that looks like boolean and return you a boolean if all or any of the pack values are true or false. You can count how many are true, finding the minimum and the maximum inside the vector, sum, product, and dot product. And we have another set of functions which is more specialized, which basically um, works on. Um, I will say something stupid there. Um, John Thierry, can you help me? It, it takes vectors in, in, uh, inside and it gets... Um, um, it modifies the vector. It modifies vector itself um, and returns something which is not necessarily of the same type of vector. It's only not element-wise. Yeah, it's all element-wise. For example, group and split can be used to say, I have a vector of 32-bit integers, give me the two equivalent vector of 16-bit uh, integer. And group does these other things backwards. You take two vectors of uh, 16 bytes and you get one of 32 bytes. So this is more or less low-level uh, conveniency functions that actually help us writing some other stuff. But they are part of the interface for whatever reasons. Okay, so we have these pack classes that make all operators behave like they should in SIMD, all these subset of functions. Now, well, there is more. We needed a way to be able to expand the library in case of new uh, extensions comes out or with new functions. And in some cases, we wanted to be able to run a raw um, intrinsic on some pack. So the library is designed, so pack is in fact a wrapper around another class, which is called natives, which is a class that maps a type and a tag representing a specific extension, like SSE, AVX, Altivec, to the row SIMD types which is required. This is completely a simple a standard layout types, okay, where all operations and all functions return the value and not an expression template. Everything is done to be as fast as possible and packed just like on top of this. And basically, X is used to uh, be able to find out what the register type I need to do this kind of operations. And all our dispatch uh, over function is done through this. And if you want to extend the library, you basically just have to uh, work on the native level and don't care about um, the complex proto stuff. And so basically here is some example. Uh, if I have a native of float on SEC, I will get basically a wrapper around M128, which is a native tip for this. If you have int 
uh, non-senior dentate on SEC, you will get the integral vector types. If you put Havix, you will have the 256 uh, bytes ver uh, version of the registers, and Hattivec will give you the vector uh, stuff it usually does. And that's native that take care of the software fallback. What happens if I'm on uh, Nativec platforms and I have a code that say, yeah, I need native of float, uh, sorry, pack of float, to, uh, pack of double to works. There is no double support in Nativec assigning extension. So what happens is that we will find out a way to say, okay, I will just act as if it was a SIMD register, which means basically I will build some kind of native with a special tag, which is called none, and say, okay, just behave like you were a register of n element, basically by wrapping a boost array of the proper size, and just behave like you were a register, so all the code works. Yes? It's not n elements, it's n bytes. Sorry, n bytes. So just behave like you were um, a register of this size, and, well, every function are implemented for the known uh, fallback, so everything works even if you uh, degrade your compilation system by not having any SIMD support or having a lack of special types of, or, uh, or extension in your support. So basically, every time you write a pack, it will functionally works. And when you write with pack and it happens that you have SIMD stuff that can make it work, you will go faster. And of course, we want users to rely on pack of T and not pack of T of N to basically ensure that Whatever happens, you will get the most out of the architectures just by finding if, by chance, your T maps to some kind of SID registers. So here's an example. Well, we got some kind of um, three-channel image here, red, green, blue, and I want to compute some kind of conversion to uh, grayscale using, well, some formulas. Also, this is a scalar version. And basically, there is, let's say, an N made uh, SIMD versions. Well, basically, what you do is you run the same loop nest, except you run it over N times less elements, where L, N is the, what we call the cardinal of the vector type, which is the number of elements you have in one register. And what you do is say, OK, let's load the current value of this table into this pack, just write the operations, and store it back. Just to say that yeah. here, for simplification reason, we suppose that 8 on this... Yeah, we will speak about that later. Of course, this only works if this value is actually a multiple, a multiple of n. So, this is not sufficient to ensure that the code you write is fully portable and generic. Because this may not be true. Okay, You may want to write code that is not based on something that can be written with a for loop. Okay, like a random arbitrary range. And we don't want people to have to remember to divide the size by this, okay, because they will forgot anyway. And there is this concrete types lying there, which is not that um, um, nice to have. So this works, and this is basically the direct transcription of what you would have written if you have written this in SAC or Altivec. I do some load, I do some operation, and I saw the results. And the only stuff currently that we change it is that instead of having to have ugly macro or whatever to wrap out, or is it M is it M128, or is it a vector float, or is it whatever, you have this layer of abstraction there. But this is not enough. And we go a bit further how we can get better than that. And the other question, yeah, okay, this is fine and dandy because you have your three tables or your three view over your three channel image which are conveniently slayed out in memory, but what if uh, first my image is not float, it's 8-bit integers? What do I do? And uh, what if I got interleave RGB or RGBA stuff? Well, it's a bit more complicated and we'll go back afterward to see how can this stuff can be done and if this make, actually makes sense to be done. So, okay, so we have these types that behaves like some kind of uh, internal register that happens to have a vectorized version of operation, so it goes faster. Okay, nice, except now me, you know, I work with vector or range or whatever ST algorithm I have, and I don't want to turn all my nice generic code in this full of for, for loop stuff, because 
I'm here for getting abstraction, not going back to for loops. So the second point that we wanted to me is make it so that every stuff we wrote there can be made compatible with classical C++ stuff. So, what happens usually? Every, the, the problem lies in how do you store the data and how can you access it? In most of the kind of search library over, uh, over the web, uh, people always come with um, custom designed container classes which sometimes, by chance, but not often, are STD compatible, but most of the time they are not, and most of the time they are not uh, customizable in terms of how to allocate or whatever. And we, we explicitly didn't want it to force a new container down the throat of people. So, basically to get a generic way to work with that, everything has to be made to work with a standard container we all know and love, which means that we have to find a way to handle all the specific memory requirements of SIMD code, which means that we will have some kind of SIMD compliant allocators that will do whatever they need to do. We have to work within the framework of range and iterators and stuff like that. So we have to get a way, so if I get a random container with some uh, specific uh, properties, I want to turn it into something I can use in my SI in the algorithm with the least uh, change possible of this. And our SIMD entities themselves should play nice with the uh, standard algorithms and uh, all the classical uh, components. So well, the easy stuff was to say, okay, um, we require that SIMD memory um, has to be aligned and when you allocate a given number of, of values, you need to allocate them so they basically map to an integral number of complete vectors. So, one of the simplest ways to do this is say, okay, there is this SIMD allocators. It will deal with whatever platform specific uh, aligned allocation scheme you need. And it will basically give this vector a pointer to a um, memory zone which is aligned. And if you look at this, well, 173 doesn't sound like something that can be divided by 16, but 166 is. And basically, internally, the memory block allocated by this actually is padded to fit these requirements, but for the vectors, it doesn't give a crap. And as long as you use the vector operations, I mean, v size will be 173, every iterator will be abnormally. But we have this small padding stuff in the memory that means that when we will work around this in an SIMD way, stuff will be there to be caught. So, okay, memory, we get an allocator, all fine and dandy. Okay, except, depending on what kind of operation we want to do on this, the padding value that lies behind these limits basically contain craps. And I don't want to actually process these craps, okay, because it doesn't make any sense. So we have to find a way to say, okay, there is some random amount of memory da and data, and can you tell me where starts and where ends the most, the largest block of SIMD compatible memory? I will take care of this using SIMD stuff, and what remains, which is usually a few, I will take or not take care of them in a scalar way. And basically, what we had is we have two functions which is called begin and end, and say, okay. Give me an iterator over a random access uh, container, and I will give you another iterator that when you iterate over it, will give you packs containing the value that lies there. But the SIMD begin starts where the first real SIMD value can be stored, and the end stops just before the last one that makes sense. So if we make a drawing like this, let's talk V, for example, and there is some there is a regular extent of V. There is a begin in the hand, okay? And what does SIMD begin will do to V begin? It basically will compute the first aligned position into this range where SIMD operation can be done. And end will give me the last, the point after the last part of where I can actually apply SIMD operation. And basically it helps us segmenting this range into three parts the vectorizable part there, and some, well, remaining parts over there. 
And when you iterate over the return of big in there, you will basically iterate over it by pack of four, or whatever your pack size is. And the pack type is basically uh, derived from the value type inside the iterator. So we always get the correct pack corresponding of whatever you are storing in your range. Excuse me. Uh, yes. I don't really understand how you pick the, the SIMD begin. You but pick it based on uh, its address, the element's address? Yes. Know? Yes. And in fact, when I say random access uh, container, in fact, it's not exactly that. It should be some refinement that I will call contiguous random access container. Except that the contiguous part is not something you can actually enforce in a concept because it relies on a runtime uh, evaluation of conditions. So basically, your data has to be so that when I have an iterator to one of my data, I am allowed to take the address of the return of the dereference operator. And this address must be uh, what we call k contiguous, which means it must be at least contiguous by pack of k. Which means this works with vector, but it also works with dq, because every part of the dq, even if they are completely separated, are locally k contiguous. So that's the all stuff we, re we require. If you are re working on pack of size n, your container should be n contiguous, which means that if I take something, I have at least n elements contiguous to this one. Yes? So are you basically assuming that a deck, a deck's blocks are multiples of whatever byte number you actually have in the... Well, if you fit it the SIMD allocator, they will be. Okay. And if they are not, well, begin with just compute me this. And what we do, well, what we should do with DQ is that we should be sure that this actual address still fits into the same block. That's we will speak about a bit later. But if everything was correct in this world, we should be able to do that. And so that's the stuff that can actually give us a, what we call a SIMD range. And basically, you can write stuff like this. You have a vector of floats, and you basically accumulate the value of the vector <coughs> using SIMD iterators over the old stuff. And this basically gives us a code that will run down the vectors eating up packs up of packs and using mm uh, ps to do the accumulation. But we can do better. We have a SIMD range function that take a range and basically extract its begin and hand, turn them into SIMD begin and SIMD hand, and give you a SIMD range. And so you can write code like this. I can accumulate value over my SIMD range v into x. But what do I get when I do this? I get a pack. My job is not done yet. Because there, what I have in this case, for example, on the SEC machines, well, we have a pack of four results, which are the four intermediate results of the accumulation in the different parts of the vectors. So it's not still yet the accumulated result of your vectors. And to do so, we need to get a bit further. And basically, well, pack and natives are ranges. So you can actually take a pack and do this. Accumulate over the element of the pack. So now if we have this, well, we can write this we can write vectorized accumulate in two paths. First accumulating over the your range, getting the a pack result of all the intermediate um, values, and then well, let's accumulate over this. Works. But we can do a bit better. We can basically use one of our reduction functions, sum, which basically acts as a specialized version of accumulate, where instead of doing a scalar additions of all the elements into the vectors, because that's what the uh, accumulate uh, will do, if any uh, sum across a vector operation is uh, present on the current uh, extension, we will use this, yes? What, what happened to the unaligned bits? Do you still have to do those separately? Sorry? What, what happened to the unaligned pieces of the vector? Do you still have to do those? Okay, yeah. When we have, well, yes, there I actually 
This is a simple example for the sake of the presentation. We have an aligned vector with a proper number of elements, so everything's good. Now, if you want it to be completely generic, I don't know if I have the slide with the complete code, I will check. Basically, we have to go to say, okay, let's start by working on the core SID parts. Okay, doing this. Then, accumulate into the accumulation of the small ranges of the non-aligned stuff before, and the non-aligned stuff after. And basically, this is one of the stuff we want to do in the GSOC, is having this completely hidden, and when you say STD accumulate of begin end, bang, it does whatever it needs to be done. Okay, that's, that's work in progress. But currently, it can work. And basically, you just have to write this kind of segmented algorithm that will do all the work. But, I mean, in the long term, we should have something like STD accumulate over SIMD iterators do whatever it needs to be done. Okay, so what happened in SAMR speedup? So, well, I could have put a lot of speedup figures everywhere, uh, taking random algorithm and making random stuff. Not that interesting because, of course, it works. No, I'm joking. <laughs> What's interesting is to see how our SIMD stuff works uh, in this non SIMD algorithm we didn't even wrote. Okay, and how far are we of the optimal speed up we can get? Or at least how far are we from the theoretical peak speed up we can get by just taking some kind of abstraction over SIMD values and pushing it into some kind of STD algorithm that doesn't know about the fact they are SIMD. And basically here is what we got for doubles. So sorry for the crooky line stuff, I think I just botched my interpolation thingy. But basically, starting from 128 doubles, we are basically at a speed up of 2 compared to the um, scalar version of Accumulate. And for floats, well, you get the same kind of stuff. And starting around 256 is the four, the time, the 4 times speed up bar. And basically, well, I've stopped it there. I went up to basically 1 megabytes, uh, 1 mega elements, and we basically, you know, Jigger around the times four lines or the time two lines. So basically, well, we take this random standard algorithm, we feed it our pack and stuff, well, and without doing anything more, okay, because what we want to say is that, okay, I don't want to dip into the, the internals of this stuff, well, I get a decent speed off, which is, looks like the maximum I should have. Well, in fact, not. We should have better than that, because if I was writing this by hand, right now, using Altivec or SEC, what I would do is basically unroll the inner loops of the accumulate so it fits all the pipelines. And basically, if my memory is not playing me games, uh, the speed up for double in this case should be around six and a half. And the speed up for float should be around nine or ten something. And this is also something that makes sense to be made into this SIMD specialization of STD accumulate. Okay, we, we don't want to have something that says, yeah, and if you do this, you get the full speed up. Our goal in the end of all this, and at the end of the GSOC, is that you take a vector, you take it as a SIMD range, okay, you feed it to STD whatever, and you get the SIMD enabled STD whatever, okay, build on top of whatever pack and our range and uh, SIMD iterator give us. But basically, the naive implementations that just do what I just show, Make a sum of STD accumulate over begin and hand gets you basically to what you may think as a neophyte as the maximum speed up you should have without much that of work. And afterward, what we want to do is that we want this to be pushed up as the maximum it should be. But without any um, intervention from uh, the users, okay? Relying on this kind of effect, just putting a bit more of um, expertise into the writing of the accumulate or the transform code. So back to uh, RGB to gray, uh, I told you a bit before that we don't like these for loops going on over and over again. So what about I write a RGB to gray that takes an output range and our three uh, input range for red, green and blue stuff. Well, this is completely independent of whatever. I would just get the iterator types, get the value type out of the iterator, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. I take all the iterator stuff for starting iterating over this. And while I've 
while I'm not at the end of my results, well, let's load a value of type type at these iterators, do some operations, and sum it back at events. Well, there is just one small non-generic detail there. This should be really type of 0.3 for consistencies. And this basically works with whatever, because if I fit that a couple of std vector floats, well, this is completely defined. This basically is overloaded for whatever iterator types, and if the iterator type is not SIMD, it will just load whatever is at the iterator's uh, position. And well, this will give us a re regular scalar operation on this, and so does Toro, which is overloaded for scalars. And now I pass, instead of passing my V over there, I pass my SIMD range of V. Well, it's a range. You got iterators, you got a value, which will be a pack. This will give us SIMD uh, iterators, and well, we will load pack as the SIMD iterators and call the pack operator overload there, computing this using pack, storing it back, advancing. And this function basically works whenever you pass SIMD or non SIMD values and ranges. And I think is that if you wanted to write something that looked like this, computing LGB to gray using this formula, uh, using um, regular values, iterator, and stuff, it will look something like this. Okay. And bonus style, now it will look like this even if you feed it SIMD data. So we keep writing uh, generic algorithms that doesn't need to be more much different. What misses, in fact, is that in this case, we should really write RV equal the reference of R to remove the dependencies from load uh, if we really wanted to write something that works in every case. And same thing there, we should have an output SIMD iterator which we doesn't have right now, but should do uh, the reference of res equal BR, uh, sorry, um, yeah, something like that. So we should really, uh, the reference BR equal res, something like this. But well, basically we are that's much close to a complete generic stuff. There's a couple of interfaces point to fix for, for these iterators and for the output iterators. But basically, if I reverting this algorithm right now without any SIMD knowledge and just use this range, it will look like this. And bonus point, all the stuff we did before fit into that. So what's missing? Yeah. As I said, we have to work down on the SD algorithms. That's part of the uh, GSOC uh, goal. Uh, we ponder the ways that can we not have some kind of boot range style adapters that just say SIMD of something, so you can say, oh yeah, SIMD of something, pipe, filtered, pipe, whatever, using the pipe notation from boot range. And we need um, support for shifted range. Basically, we need a begin of N and an end of N that give you the range where you shift it by N using load of TN. So we can have a bit more a range-like support for this kind of operation, which are very important. And uh, if, people that, if some people around there doesn't know what to do this tonight or yesterday, uh, next week, well, can I actually write a SIM defined? That makes sense. Can I actually write a SIMD sort? And is it worthy or not to accelerate stuff like copy? Well, this should be trivial, but this, well, if anybody has an idea, well, we are thinking it. Yes. Probably shouldn't write copy. You should not, because it's a full memory bound algorithm. You will keep, you will still keep um, pumping memory out and memory in and whatever, and you will get no acceleration of this, or very few. And in fact, we did the test, and at some point there was a slide just after that about SIMD uh, copy, and we ended up with the following results. If we use STD copy on the range or on the SIMD range, let's say a float, so the difference between the two is four, as we wish. And now we compare to um, STD mem copy, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, STD mem copy is three times faster than the vectorized versions. So we say, okay. <laughs> so I get, I don't know what's going on in mem copy, but well. It's, it's assembly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's one assembly calls or whatever, and so bang. It's a rep move, whatever, or something like this, I guess. I don't remember. So, yeah. So, it's a bit like, you know, it's a bit like Proto, you know. Uh, 
uh, it's all funky and dandy and you want to use it everywhere, well, just think five seconds before putting this everywhere. So with a lot of problems that looks like it can be vectorized because, oh look, I load all this stuff and put it, all this stuff there one by one. I can put this one five by five or 16 by 16, whatever. Except, well, the main point is SIMD, well, it's the D, it's the data. If you don't do anything in your data, well, doesn't make any sense to try to vectorize this. So did you try, say, the degenerate case where you made your n equal to 1 yep. and, and then run like the standard? The, if you yeah, like, it works, the, except for one stuff that we speak right afterwards. Okay. There is a fundamental difference between a type T and a pack of 1T. It's all they handle the Boolean value. And here is why. So there is some sp very specific SIMD stuff that people that wrote SIMD code by hand should know about, I hope, and that we actually try to map into a meaningful way in our library. So the first is, yeah, the problem of the Boolean value is in SIMD. So I got these two pack, one which is full of 1, 2, 3, 4, and, which, and the other one which is basically 2.5, 2.5, repeated four times. And LT is the operation that say, give me a pack of true-false, depending on if x is less than c or not. What is the expected output on the standard output line? What kind of display will I get? I should get something like 1100. Zero, zero. One, zero, zero. OK, whose thing is this? Raise your hand. Okay, except not. Mm. Boolean values play a very specific role in SIMD code. In SIMD code, I will just show you right afterwards. There is a very powerful uh, feature, which is uh, what is called select or uh, where in different um, instruction set. I say, if you give me a vectors with bits, which are 0 or 1, and you give me two vectors, A and B, I will build you a new vector where each byte of C is the corresponding bits of A, sorry, if the bits of the mask is 1, and the bits of B if it's false. And basically you have some kind of bit level selection between values. So when the mask is random, like 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0 on the bits, it doesn't make much sense, but it's helpful. But what it makes sense is that with this, we can actually vectorize F. Because if you make so, when you make a comparison or any Boolean operations, your true value is not 1, but complement of 0, which is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, all the bits, which means you end up with something like this. So a floating point value where every bit is 1, which is basically displayed as NaN, and 0 for false, I can actually select, using this, one of the other branch on the F by basically using this select operation where all the bits are taken together to be uh, selected. But this has this counterintuitive effect that the true value in SIMD, it's not 1, it's tilde of 0 for integers and this strange NAND values for float, which is the float where every bit is set to 1. And basically, you should not try to write stuff like, okay, uh, I make a test and I test if everything is equal to 1, thinking it's true or equal to true. Well, you have to go through some constant which is called true and false of t, which what's with respect to t and the corresponding um, extrusion set will return you the proper bit fields, uh, bit patterns that represent true or false. Hopefully, right now, every instruction set in SIMD mode returns 0 for false. Uh, I'm pretty sure every stuff returns this strange NAND thingy. Uh, I don't know any of any specific assigned stuff that do something else. So this is correct, in fact, when you display this. As it may sound, as strange as it may sound, getting a NAND there is not really a NAND. It's a true in the floating point value. So this is a bit counterintuitive. And this is why we don't allow bool as a valid type for um, pack. Because, where is the second part? How many elements do I get there? I get four. Because pack of float is four elements on these particular architectures. Okay, 
I can, get, I can tell you that if I have done the same stuff using pack of short, I will have eight values there as a boolean. So now what should I take if I had a pack of bool? One, two, four, eight, sixteen, over nine thousand, we don't know. So there is no pack of bool because of this. When you have a boolean value, it will be stored into the same types that your uh, 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 actual uh, input arguments. So this is a bit uh, counterintuitive. Uh, we could have done something like pack of bool of float and pack of bool of char, but we went against it because uh, for us it was too much of the underlying stuff coming back up into the interfaces. Okay, so now, how can I use this to make actual vectorization? Yeah, so here is some Scala code. So we have three variables, x, y, z, defined before. Okay. And if x is bigger than 4, I want y to be equal to 2 times x. And if not, I want z to be equal to 1 over x. Can I vectorize this code? First intuition, well, it's a control, it's a control statement, so I should not. Well, now, let's play this small game in our heads. What if I put there, into this branch, right after this, I write z equal z. And there I write y equal y. Now we have the exact same operation on the exact same data in both branches. So I can write stuff like this. y is equal to 2 times x when x is greater than 4. If not, it's equal to y. And z is equal to z if x is bigger than 4. If not, it's equal to 1 over x. And basically, you can vectorize this kind of if block. So, this is a very important idiom because we are actually able to turn a substantial part of use case of f into something that doesn't do any jump or control, but only do operation on values. And so, it's also very important because this kind of code transformation, well, you're trading branching and stuff for complete data parallel computation. And, well, this basically will add up because you will get the SIMD speed up over there and you will get this additional hidden speed up because you removed all this branching stuff. And all in all, all this stuff can actually lead to when you actually bench your stuff, you get some kind of, well, you get some kind of super linear speed up. Yes? But you will be doing the division every time. Yes, what happens there is you do all branches every time, okay, and this is actually, yes, uh, the good point of this. Division is very, very expensive. Well, usually, most of, the, most of the time, you will win more by being able to run four tests like this in parallel compared to the cost of computing both branches. Uh, well, we have the example in our slide from last year where we basically use this in computing complex polynomials for cosinus and the impact is completely negligible. Because some things also play there is that both branches can actually be pipelined properly. And so basically, the SIMD width plus the pipeline plus the removal of the benching, one in whole, well, you get speed up. What is important is that if you start having more than, if you're having a large number of this kind of stuff chain one into the others, at the point where you have basically twice as much wear than the number of elements in the vector, you start losing speed. That's something empiric measurements we did, but basically, you can basically wear off, wear off, wear off, wear, whatever, up to basically twice the size of the vectors before starting, you know, Losing uh, performances. Sorry. The division stalls the pipelines. No, 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 no. You, you, you can actually fire this and this and this, one after the others, and everything will be pipelined. So at the end, when the when the wear actually executes, most of the time you got all, everything you need because of the pipelining. So now. The grumpy part is that currently you have to turn this into that manually. Okay, now let's put some kind of 
projection in the futures, what can be nice is like, what about I use, oh, I don't remember this name of this library already, yeah, you know, you, you, you put the funky underscore there and you put some kind of square bracket over there, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Just like that, I don't know why. And basically, well, why not having some kind of stuff based on Phoenix or whatever proto-based statement that you write stuff that looks a lot like this and you get that. In the same way we turn A plus B times C into Mac. Should be, can be something that can be explored. But most of the time, well, unless you have so, a so deep spaghetti if code that you can't actually make any sense of it, this transformation is, as, is rather lightweight to be done by hand. So now, there is another use case. SIMD is mostly used, or was mostly used, and still is, uh, for a lot of signal and image processing stuff. And one thing that came a lot in image processing is this small, discrete uh, filter implementation where you basically have this sliding window going over your data, loading some pack of stuff, and computing something to get one result there, and you basically do this, sliding everything this. And basically, if you write this in a bit of a naive way, you end up with something like the result of i is equal, let's say we do a, a sliding average, is one third of the sum of x of i minus one, x of i, and x of i plus one. Okay, so now let's assume that r of zero and x of zero are all aligned. So I can load SIMD pack from this. Can I vectorize this? Well, naively you can because you have this pesky minus plus one that underline your position in the table. And you, can, you cannot just say R of R equal of one third times load on E minus one, load on E and load on E plus one using the addresses because it will end up into unaligned accesses. So we can actually still vectorize this. So first step is actually looking at this and unrolling this code by a, power, by a factor of four. Instead of filling one element, okay, let's pretend I work on float, I will fill four at a time, okay? So I will need a bit more access there, but each time I advance this window, I get four results, okay? And now look, what is this in this column? Well, it starts for four times i, which is an alien addresses, and it has one, two, three, four elements. So this stuff can actually fit into a vector using load. And so there's this that can fit in the store because it's aligned too. And what is remaining is this and this. But wait, what is this? This is actually loading from there and then shifting by one, back. And this is what? This is this, but shifting by what? Forward. So basically this turn into this. VR, which is a vector of results there, is one third of loading something on Vx, slightly shifted off by minus one, Vx unshifted, and Vx shifted by one. And every time we do this, we basically eat up two contiguous vector, we do some kind of unaligning, and we go forward this, feeding out four results at a time. Which means that any calls that look like I am doing stuff on polynomials of my indexes, can be actually turned into something that looks like, oh well, I work on vectors, but now the polynomials, or at least there's the affine stuff, get into there. Okay, now what's left to do? Well, if I make load with an offset works on regular scalar value, this is a generic way to express the filter, whatever Vx or Vr are SIMD or not. Okay? You can generalize this to whatever size n vec um, filters, of course. You can do it in 2D, but it's rather s far easier because if you do your work right, every line starts aligned. So this basically is a this done times the number of lines in your filters. 
and nothing much to do. And the code is basically this one. I take random range, again, I get my member jumbo with the iterator and the types, I get my iterators, I shoot a bit there, I'm advancing a bit and going back a bit backwards on the range size, so I don't have to explicitly deal with borders, because dealing with borders in filtering is a problem in itself, okay? So I wanted to keep the example trivial to look at, okay? And while I'm not up there, well, I load with some offsets into my x minus 1, x, x plus 1. And I just write my formula there. And same crap, it should be t of 1 divided by 3 there. Yes? Question. When you're doing those unaligned loads, aren't you going to end up loading the same pack three times? In fact, that was the code does. But in fact, when you look at what the compiler does, it checks that, oh, wait, come on, I just need to load two stuff. That was our uh, fear when we started doing this. We were like, crap, it will be bad because we will load six stuff instead of two and doing the thingy. And uh, we will have to get some kind of higher level stuff to express filters, and we were quite sad. And in fact, on most uh, proper compiler, if you see what I mean, this load, all this code,